I, I asked for a stool because I'm going to tell a story, and it's, all, it's awkward to stand up and tell a story. Never, my mother never did that. She never stood up and told me a story before I went to sleep. <laughs> it was awkward, so I thought I want a stool. Uh, what a chat. Um, the irony about my story starts about my, with my name. My name is Firas Al Khuri. It's in Arabic means the uh, future predicting priest. <laughs> if you would have asked me five years ago about my future, I wouldn't have into my wild dream that I will be sitting uh, on a red red dot on a uh, TEDx of TED stage talking about my life story. I had a complete other picture of myself. The other irony is actually the title of my speech, Choices of a Refugee. Do you think that any refugee has a choice? I didn't have a choice. I am here because I didn't have a choice. I was born in Iraq, lived there uh, till my 26. I was actually born to a middle class family. I was one of those very, very annoying children that I would, would just stop you and say, sir, I want to be a doctor when I grow up. So, and I worked hard to do that. I managed that. I, at, at my 25th years, I was gradu just graduated, fresh doctor, went to work uh, as, as emergency doctor in one of the middle, middle small, middle, big uh, hospitals in Baghdad. And I was very happy at that. I did it, and I thought I did it good, until one day, uh, it was one of, the, one, one of my late shifts, and then, then they, they come, a huge amount of, of people, a very big family. They are carrying this pale, cold, what you can call dead person. And he, they just put, it in front, put him in front of, of, on, front, on, on my desk. And they asked me to reanimate him, just bring him back to life. Like, I, I was like, let me just check if, he's, if, if that's even possible. So I did my what you call in Dutch, Bischauer. So you listen to the heart for one minute, and if there is no beat, heartbeat, you say, he's dead. I'm not going to do anything, especially because I don't know what happened. Like, how long is he like that? I... But they didn't agree. They insisted that I have to reanimate him. They insisted that I have to bring him back to life. I tried to explain to them that that won't help, that we have to at least respect the death He's dead. We have to respect the dead. That's like a, a worldwide principle that we all believe in. But they didn't believe in. They, they started to shout at me. And one of them started to hit me. And the other started to hit me. And then they had the, the fists the fist kept coming. The, the kicks kept coming. The, one of them used his pistol to kick me. Wonderly, I, I managed to flee the hospital. I went to, to the police station, to police station. And I asked them, I, I told my story, and the, poli the policeman behind the desk said, so you are that doctor who killed Mr. X. I, won't, I don't want to know, bring in names. So that moment was for me, okay, I'm not going to go back home today. I'm going to go to another friend, and other friends to other friends, and to another friends, and to another friends. This kept, I kept doing this for a month. And so one, one day I thought, this is won't happen. My life isn't safe. I'm not... Iraq is not safe for me. I have to do something because the friends I am staying at aren't safe and, uh, as well. So I found this man. He, he managed to bring me to the Netherlands. So after a very long road trip, here I am at the Netherlands. And my very own first day at the Netherlands, I met this huge, big security guard who found my stethoscope in my backpack when he had to search it. And he asked me, he was very enthusiastic, you're a doctor. And I, was, I just spent 10 days in the stomach of a truck, not really feeling like a doctor. I said, I was a doctor. And he looked at me very surprised. And he said, once a doctor is always a doctor. And that, I still, I still have this, this goosebump when I say it. But it's that moment, that moment he said that, I got, the, I got this, yes, he's right. I'm still a doctor. I have the knowledge, I have the information. All I have to do is translate the knowledge I have into Dutch. It shouldn't be that difficult. So I went to the library right away, found this book, Dutch for Dummies. I thought, yes, this is my book. 
This is my book, <laughs> Dutch for Dummies. So I started with Dutch for Dummies, but I, I didn't stop with Dutch for Dummies because I was, nothing else was important. I have this goal ahead of me. I had this goal, I had to, to, to speak Dutch. I had to become a doctor again. I have to find myself back. Well, in this, in this period, like after, I, I didn't account, even when I was at the IND, the immigration services, I, was, I sat there and asking them, what does this mean, mean? What does this word mean? And what does that word mean? How do I pronounce this? How do I pronounce it? So I didn't pay any attention to the whole fact that I just flee Iraq, that I'm now here in the Netherlands, knowing no one, knowing nothing. Three days after, after a lot of courses, a lot of exams, a lot of uh, failing, a lot of, a lot of successes, here I am applying for a job as a, in, in the academic hospital of Maastricht, and I was uh, hired. I am now a medical doctor in, in my academic hospital of Maastricht as a cardiothoracic surgeon. Not a surgeon, assistant surgery. So I was very happy. I was like, yes, this is it. I imagined I would, be, I would be happy because I'm now in my goal. But then I was on the top of the hill. I reached my goal. I was the... But then one question kept me awake at night, and now what? But who am I now? I, am, I reached my goal, but how I came here? Where is home now? Iraq isn't home anymore because I became too Dutchy to be Iraqi. And I'm not Iraqi anymore because I am too Dutchy. Uh, yeah, other way around. <laughs> you, you got the idea. So I heard once, once someone saying that the Journey is as important as the destination. So I thought to myself, I am at my destination, but what was my journey? I have no idea. All I think about was me looking at this goal. I want to reach that goal. So I went, I went back. I, did, I, I planned this road, road uh, bike, bike trip from Maastricht, where I work, live, work as a doctor, to Groningen, where I came as a refugee. Along, this, along the, the, the way, I would pass by all the asylum centers where I stayed and, I, as a doctor, uh, sorry, as a refugee. So my first step was Venlo. The first, man, the, the first time I came at Venlo, I was very happy, like 100 kilometers up behind me, cycling. Well, that was very, very happy, but I did it. So I was very happy. But then I saw a sign, like, welcome, and I was extremely happy. And then I went to, my, to the room where I stayed there as a refugee. And the room I once pictured, once picture like like this is this is uh, it's a huge it's a cozy it's it's a nice it's warm it's safe it wasn't cozy it wasn't safe it wasn't warm it was cold I felt I felt everything was against me but then I realized I feel that because it's I am not comparing the room to the stomach of a truck anymore I'm comparing to what I find my amazing house in, in Maastricht I am not that refugee anymore and this roller coaster of emotions repeated itself in. Wageningen in Arnhem, and then in Terrapol, I got this amazing chance to meet Mitchell, that security guy. When I met him, the most, important, the most beautiful part about meeting that he didn't know who I am. He had no clue. He just, for him, it was just a fact. You're a doctor, you'll always be a doctor. So he didn't know me. And the second, second uh, uh, beautiful part about, uh, about our meeting was that Mitchell wasn't that big. <laughs> wasn't that huge guy. He was just my size. He was, about, I, he was about my size. I was like, I told him, like, I always pictured you. Even when I told people about, about you, I was like big, huge, typical <laughs> Dutch person. But he wasn't. He was my size. But that, well, then I realized that I am not that refugee anymore who feels like nothing. I am now, I stand tall. I look people in the eyes and I talk to them. I am a proud person. That moment, that moment I felt like I am who I am. I am Firas. This moment I felt complete. This moment I felt proud. And I also learned those moments that they just ha they happened five years ago. They, I, I had those moments, but I didn't, I wasn't aware about, about those moments. I learned like that those moments shouldn't be a big one. I shouldn't bike 400 kilometers to, to have such a moment. Such a moment can be a laugh with a friend, a hug from a, an, an, a good friend, or, or just, just a smile of, some, of someone you help. And I realized, like, if I, if, I just, if I just focus on those moments and, like, 
put to myself, like, this is, this is one of those moments for us. You'll need it. And when life isn't easy as, as, it, as I would like it to be, I look back at those moments and I tell, say, say to myself, this is your life. This is what, what that, how you feel now isn't your life. This is your life. Just be aware of those happy moments and keep in your mind, once home is always home. Thank you.